We're taking a short break this week. We'll have fresh interviews with Australia's technology leaders soon. This is a continuing part of the CXO Challenge by itnews.com.au. I'm your host, Ry Crozier, Editor-in-Chief of IT News. On the show this week is Peter Robinson, the Director of Security and IT at ASX-listed fintech and buy now, pay later provider, Zipco. We discuss Zipco's IT and security functions, the company's cloud estate and the way it manages and monitors this environment, and what security awareness looks like at the company. We hope you enjoy this conversation. I just wondered if maybe we could just start with some background around Zip and its IT organization. Just wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the nature of your environment and the team that works on it. Sure. So I've been at Zip for just over two and a half years. When I joined, I was the only security person in a very rapidly growing organization. So we've grown from about six or seven cloud accounts and about 100 people to 43 cloud accounts and almost 1,000 people in the two and a half years that I've been in the organization. Zip is a financial services, a fintech organization in the buy now, pay later space. And we've grown out of Australia and into the UK and the US, Europe, the Philippines, Japan, New Zealand, and South Africa, all within the last two years or so. So it's been a, a very, very rapid expansion, hyper growth. And I think uh, if anyone was, was to take a look at it, they'll see that uh, cybersecurity is very, very challenging under those conditions. So you mentioned the large growth in the number of cloud accounts. I was wondering if you could just give us a little bit more of a sense of your cloud environment. I think you've in both AWS and Azure, as far as I understand, but I just wondered if you could explain a bit more about how you treat cloud services internally and the sort of multi-account structure. Sure. So Zip is a cloud-only organization. We, we, we grew up in the cloud. We were born in the cloud, grew up in the cloud. We have no on-prem data center or infrastructure or anything like that at all. I've got a couple of firewalls and Wi-Fi access points in the office, and that's about it. Zip itself was born and raised in AWS, and we've expanded that over time. So we have different environments for development, staging, production, obviously. We have some testing environments. We have a workspaces environment, etc. In AWS alone, I think we're now 22 environments. This includes our subsidiary organizations or acquisitions that we've made in that time, Pocketbook and The Urge and a few others like that. So that expansion has been pretty rapid. Mostly outside of Australia, we're in Azure. So in the US and UK, Canada, Mexico, we're in Azure, where our, our subsidiary quad pay is leading the charge. Do all the main systems run out of a separate cloud account? How's it kind of divided up? So the, the, the cloud accounts are sort of divided up by their purpose. So we, we have particular cloud accounts just for staging and for testing and development. We have an integrations cloud account where we just do our IO through web or production web services environment. We have a production backend systems environment and so on. So there's lots of different cloud accounts that we have for different purposes. And the reason we keep those sort of separate is, I guess, for containment, we can facilitate connectivity to what, for example, a team of developers needs versus a team of customer service people. You know, they have different needs, so we, we give them access to different cloud accounts. Mm -hmm. And you talked a little bit briefly at the start about the rapid growth that you've been on over the past sort of three years that you've been there. I just wondered if you could just explain that a little bit more in terms of the way that systems and processes have also evolved over that time. All right. So Zip itself has expanded even here in Australia. So we launched initially with a product called Zip Money. And about three years ago, we expanded that to Zip Pay. And that sort of brought about different requirements for different things. We scaled around the time we brought on Amazon as a client. So we scaled out, we built new different environments. So we have entire infrastructures now. There are nine new sets of infrastructure here in Australia that are just to build uh, using Kubernetes and Terraform and things like that. So fully infrastructure as code where some of our older gear is still more manual and not as dynamic. But I think the main thing is, is that outside of Australia, so our part pay acquisition, which brought along with it quad pay and PayFlex in South Africa, and our expansions into the UK and Mexico and Canada have all been in Azure. 
and those have a sort of a more of a hub and spoke model rather than the model we have in AWS here in Australia, which is sort of environment f for purpose, if you know what I mean. They, they have multiple different entities within their environment. We have multiple different environments. So I think mm. one of the biggest challenges through that acquisition process is as the company acquires new businesses, of which there have been seven or eight in recent times, just bringing them on board, getting our security technology and our capabilities across those. They're disparate and they, they have different processes and different technologies and different CICD pipelines and everything else. I understand that you're using a lot of serverless and infrastructure as code that sort of comes with this ephemeral, this kind of farts nature of spinning things up and tearing things down. Um, yeah. And this kind of comes back to the story that we're kind of talking about today, which is this whole sort of monitoring challenge around that. And I th thought maybe just to start with, if you could explain a little bit about what you're monitoring for and sort of how you were addressing this uh, previously. Well, I think uh, the, to the point is we weren't able to monitor it. We weren't able to address it previously. But the challenge is, is that we, we have very ephemeral environments with ephemeral assets. So if we're in full flight here in Australia in the middle of the day, when our backend systems are running at their peak, we can spin up anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 server systems to do approvals and things like that. And then by 5 o'clock in the afternoon, those are all gone again. But they're all hosting mirror images of certain capabilities that you need to look after and protect. Even in our normal systems, you know, they, they spin with load, they grow and they scale as is required. And we bring on a lot of new capabilities quite regularly. So Zip has kind of branched out into lots of different areas of business and all those come with new identity repositories and API capabilities and things like that. And the challenge was just keeping up with those is just understanding like where are you at at any particular time and what needs to have security on it and what doesn't need to have security on it. And I think the other challenge that I was facing was quite simply put, the speed at which the business is moving, things get left behind very quickly. Ideas turn into products, turn into legacy infrastructure in months in a company like Zip, um, as everyone's working on the next thing. So to just quite keep an eye on all of that and keep track of it was really challenging across so many different cloud accounts. Can you maybe just step back a little bit and just explain this sort of ephemeral infrastructure model that you run <laughs> and how it actually looks in practice in terms of when you, you mentioned coming in in the morning and basically spinning up a whole bunch of instances for certain applications, if you can describe sort of what sort of applications yes, are really yes. consuming that resource? Sure. For example, we have a whole backend automated system that allows us to validate and verify whether or not we should be doing loans for people. So people apply for loans. And then we have a whole decisioning engine that sits on the back of that. And it's based on quite a substantial amount of rules engine type systems and a bit of machine learning and external API connectivity to credit bureaus and to social systems and things like that. And of course, to keep the latency down for people applying, you know, you want to make people wait while they're trying to apply for a loan, we'll actually spin things up in real time. So as an application comes through, we'll spin up a decisioning engine just for that particular thing, or we'll preempt it based on predicted load for the day so that we keep our latency down and allow our systems to operate when uh, demand is high. So it's already an on-demand function. Even our backend core databases can expand laterally and what that really means in a nutshell is if you've got two computers or two servers that are running at a time, if they experience a load over 60%, they'll fire up a third one and so on and so on until they're all running at the same level. And then come five o'clock at night, if they all drop below 20% again, they'll start dropping off. So we have li literally have systems coming and going throughout the day. Let's talk a little bit about this specific project that you had worked on with Orca. Where did this all sort of come from? When did it sort of start to take shape? I've been looking around for a vulnerability management solution that would fit the needs of my organization. This is something that I've been doing for quite some time, the, the vulnerability management thing for different organizations long before I met Zip. And I think with the cloud comes a particular challenge, particularly when you have that many ephemeral assets coming and going. Traditional vulnerability scanning devices require you to sort of buy endpoint licensing volumes, if you know what I mean. So for every yep. server, you've got to buy a license. And for me, that was just a, a crazy thing. Secondly, they want to deploy endpoint agents onto those devices, which again is a crazy thing, given that I've got these assets scaling up and down. 
another mechanism that's used often to scan for vulnerabilities and stuff is the network-based scanning, which requires credentials on the endpoint and network access. So again, trying to keep up with the uh, fast-moving environment and the infrastructure that's continuously changing to try and keep those things up to date in there was nuts. So after quite some time, I think of about two years at the Zip, we were only really about 30, 40% of our infrastructure was covered or, or visible at any given time even though we were using open source tooling just to, to avoid the licensing problem. And then I came across uh, Orca through a friend of mine who had recently joined Orca, a gentleman I'd spoken to previously about a different product. And I guess he said, have a look at this. And I was like, it can't be true. And he was like, no, no, it is. It does what it says on the tin. And I'm like, I don't believe you. <laughs> so I fired up a trial and uh, we never really looked back from there. Okay, cool. Just to unpack that, can you explain the open source tooling that you were using previously to try and get around these challenges with our licensing and um, with the end, yes, uh, endpoints? So we were using OpenVAS, which is the open open source vulnerability assessment scanner. Um, it's freely available on the internet. And then we, we had some basically API integration with our Amazon infrastructure to pull sets of IP addresses of currently running assets out of there and feed it. So we had to script a lot of stuff and actually manually, in some cases, uh, feed the scanners so that they actually knew what to look for. And then in addition to that, there was a whole bunch of problems about all those endpoints. You know, vulnerability scanning, especially network scanning like that, doesn't work very well. If you can't actually log into the server you're trying to scan and have a look at the operating systems and versions of things and its configuration and stuff like that. It is a particularly useful tool, but not for, again, dynamic environments. And you mentioned that you were scanning a particular percentage of your environment. Can you explain a little bit about the problems with doing that for your organization? Quite frankly, just, just for me, you know, I always know that uh, what you can't defend what you don't know about and you can't protect, you know, what you can't see. So I like to have 100% visibility of that, which I'm trying to protect. I think any organization wants to know that their internet facing systems are secured and protected and hardened and patched and don't have any configuration errors and things like that. The biggest problem with that is, again, you can't know about what you can't see. You know, so, yep, yep. so if I said I've got 1600 servers running today, but I only have vulnerability reports from 25 or 50, you know, 200, that's still a small percentage of that. You sort of sit there with this unknown risk. What do those things actually look like? And I think the other challenge with the cloud infrastructure is trying to understand and correlate configuration information out of those cloud infrastructures with the actual endpoint assets. So for example, if I've got a server that's running Linux and it's vulnerable to something, how do I prioritize that over a Windows server that's also vulnerable to something? You have to take into consideration whether those things are A, in production or not, or B, whether they're actually exposed to the internet or not. And when you multiply that across couple of hundred servers, you sort of end up in a five-day exercise of budging things in spreadsheets just to understand whether the server that you found with vulnerabilities on it is actually a problem because it may or may not be exposed to the internet on a specific port and the vulnerabilities that you find on it might not be relevant to the port that's exposed on the internet and so on. So there's a lot of work that goes along with traditional vulnerability management just to prioritize and go like, is this something I should care about this morning or not? Which is something Orca does for us straight out of the box. So we can have you know, a couple of hundred thousand vulnerabilities on systems, some of them being information or low level or whatever, but it'll say, here are your 72 that you should be caring about today because of these reasons. And that's kind of where our human process then starts, whereas before our human process would start much further up that trend. And you able to give me some uh, an example or, or a couple of ideas of some benefits that you um, have got from it? I know we've kind of covered it in kind of reverse sequence in terms of the challenges, but if you could just sort of give me a couple of ideas about what you think you've really gained from uh, implementing the tool, that'd be useful. We're a pretty small team at Zip, so we recently got some additional folks. But my first year and a half at Zip, I was there on my own, and then I got two guys. So up until about midway through last year when we had Orca come in, we were three people running this global entity, multi-cloud account sort of infrastructure. And the one thing that every organization struggles with is you know, trying to get more and more people in an environment where there's a skills shortage. And also, we have to run lean, mean, and hard in a company like Zip. So just getting new people is actually uh, difficult and it takes time to train them and things like that. So I think the biggest problem that it's solved is it's added a whole bunch of additional resource to my capability. 
without me having to get analysts and people to trawl through disparate data systems and, and trying to figure out how to prioritize today's work. It saved us a lot of time and effort. Makes sense. Okay, great. You mentioned you've got a small team, but are there things that you're particularly looking to do um, within the organization or drive within the organization sort of this year? Currently across the buy now, pay later sector in Australia, at least there's a code of conduct that was released recently. I'm not sure if you're aware how this thing works in Australia with the buy now, pay laters, but unlike other financial entities, we're not regulated. We have some regulated product in in the mix, but we don't have APRA full CPS 234 coming down on us, you know, continuously with auditors, etc. I'm envisaging that that will probably change, particularly as we move into other markets and other parts of the world and kind of uh, have their own view on this as well. So the, the minor pay later sector is one of those that's just kind of snuck in. But given that we're not holding other people's money in escrow like a normal bank would be, there's like, well, you know, it's just a it's just payment rails really at the end of the day. But I think the government is looking to either change the definition of what they call critical infrastructure here in Australia, financial services being in that, or that they're going to choose to regulate via APRA or some other body in Australia. Um, we're still subject to the likes of PCI for payment card industry data security standard, and we have to adhere with those regulations and have to be certified and compliant all around the world. But it does change the risk profile of the organization compared to you know a bank or a traditional financial services organization. So we, we have to move faster and quicker. You can't be, you can't get hacked. If that happens, there's massive reputational impact. And I, I keep telling people that that's the, there are sort of three things that we do as security people at Zip. And the first and foremost is keep us out of the press for any wrong reasons, enable our business to grow and be able to tell auditors or third party assessors or whoever a story that doesn't come with a certificate of compliance. So that's quite challenging, especially as we grow and bring on more and more substantial merchants and partners. So, for example, last year we brought on, year before last now, we brought on Amazon as a partner here in Australia. And that came with like a very large set of contractual obligations. But it's uh, certainly an interesting uh, area. I've worked in large financials before. I was at AMP and I was at CBA and Westpac and a number of those, you know, they generally operate on a different model. They have different risk profiles, different risk tolerances and things like that. So operating at Zip, I think the other thing I'm looking forward to for this year, I'm hoping it for is some increased automation of our capabilities where we actually mature to the point where the systems and infrastructure and that sort of stuff is stabilized enough that our problem finding tools can drive our problem fixing tools, if you know what I mean. Whereas at the moment you've got problem finding tools and then you've got problem fixing tools and there's a big people process in between there to make decisions about things. So there's a learning process that goes along with that as well before you can trust things to automatically self heal and repair and stuff like that. But that's the next step. That's the plan. Okay, cool. And just on briefly, uh, you mentioned or touched very briefly on around security awareness there. And I just wondered if you could explain a little bit about how you approach security awareness within your organization. Well, we start with our developers. We run Secure Code Warrior as a training platform. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's gamified developer training from a security perspective. We also run normal onboarding security awareness training for our staff as part of our general sort of HR thing. And then we have other products that do security awareness training through gamified phishing programs which has been quite a lot of fun actually with our people, getting them to spot whether things are real or not real. They kind of get bragging rights. So yeah, I saw that, how come you didn't see that? Like, is it? And then there's a bunch of additional training that we go along with that, that they can kind of go up the rankings, if you know what I mean. So again, it's one of those things where if you just present it as mandatory training, you're gonna get mandatory clicking through. But if you gamify it and you make it something the organization actually takes a bit of fun in, it's a lot more successful. Do you have a different starting position there in terms of being a fairly tech-centric, tech-focused organization, or is the challenge still much the same? Uh, look, the, the, the challenge is pretty much the same, except that we're probably a more developer-heavy organization. We've still got marketing people and sales people and customer service people and finance people and all the same things that any other organization has. I think the challenges are pretty much the same. And even with our 
a very tech savvy large pool of developers they aren't necessarily security people they build what they build and they they get the job done and then i, I think the big trick is to try and shift that security left so you, you're creating a thought process that is at idea inception rather than an uh, idea productionization if you know what i mean so I've spent a lot of time working with the development teams and the developers and the salespeople and the marketing about their ideas and what they want to bring to bear down the track. So we can start providing the right level of consulting and engagement and integration with their projects. I mean, we, we've had uh, great business ideas that when you look at how to secure them, they just die. You know what I mean? Because it just sort of takes all the profit out of even thinking about it in the beginning. Whereas we've had other things where we can go, well, if we do this, we can actually do more. We can actually do more of the same thing. So, for example, what Zip's doing now with credit cards, we have a tap and zip product. We have a one-time use credit card and there's more coming in that space. You know, we do BPay and all kinds of other really cool services all through the same rails. And that's what I was talking about, business enablement, where you actually bring security to bear, which enables the business to do more cool stuff like that. Just one more question, if I can. Sure. Um, I know you run a very lean team. However, if there are people that are listening that uh, would like to work at Zip or work in your kind of part of the organization, are there any tips you could give them about what Zip looks for and what you look for? Look, I think being a self-starter, being able to actually, we, we have a motto and it's right here on my sleeve. We wear it on our sleeves, hashtag own it. Uh, you know, and that is kind of a company slogan. It's kind of a marketing slogan, but it's also an internal staff slogan. We do it like that. So it's, if you see a problem, well, just own it until it's fixed. So that's why I run IT at Zip as well is because no one else was doing that. So <laughs> you kind of go, well, I can do that too. So, okay, I'm just going to own that and carry <laughs> on. So it, I think uh, having that confidence backing yourself is something that we look for. We've been talking extensively over the last year about what makes a Zipster and what the differences are between the way we operate and the way other organizations operate. And I think we came to the conclusion that when we hire people, we're often looking for the wrong skill sets. You're looking for those qualifications, particularly in cybersecurity. I recently brought a 22-year-old university graduate on board as a junior analyst in the organization partly because she's so super keen to get into cybersecurity. You know, we were out scouring the markets for the right people to join the organization. He said, you're asking the wrong questions. You don't want to be asking the questions around what certifications you have and your qualifications and how many years experience. You want to be doing a more psychological evaluation of how self-motivated are these people? How good are they are at self-education? Because we're going places where business hasn't been before. There's really no precedent. You know, in cybersecurity, if you think you know what's happening in cybersecurity now, just give it three months. So if you're not a voracious self-educator, you're in trouble just by definition of our industry.